Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we're going to be talking about Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a Jewish mystical tradition that's been around in written form since about the 12th century, but has a much older oral tradition. And we are fortunate that one of the team here is somewhat of an expert in Kabbalah. Joseph has been studying Kabbalah since your late teens, True. if I'm right, Joseph. Yeah. The Kabbalah and the study of the Kabbalah has been important to Joseph uh, for a long time and is a major part of the work that he does. And he is going to be sharing with us today the significance of the Kabbalah. And I think for our interest here on the podcast, the Kabbalah is another way in to psyche and to psychic experience. And Jungian thought and psychological explorations can be enriched by these many different roads that we can travel in order to gain a perspective on the inner world. So Joseph, just starting out, would you just talk to us about how you became interested in the Kabbalah? Back in high school, this is the late 1970s, I became interested in mysticism and New Age ideas in general. Though I was raised in the relatively small village of Huntington on Long Island, the culture was influenced by New York City, which was only an hour train ride away, so it was a fairly culturally sophisticated area. Just to give you a sense of the time, our high school drama teachers were living together in a kind of spiritual commune, and they integrated yoga, archetypes, and a few Gurdjieff or fourth way methods into our theater education. My lovely English teacher was a Rosicrucian who taught a few of us astrology. All of this piqued my interest and sent me searching for information in a local metaphysical bookstore called Avatar in Northport. At 16 or so, I walked in and clumsily asked for a book on chalk rocks. Very kindly, the owner squinted for a moment, and then he said, Do you mean chakras? And feeling <laughs> very embarrassed, I kind of slunk out the door with uh, Leadbeater's book on the chakras. And despite my embarrassment at the time, the bookstore held a kind of numinous quality for me, and I frequently returned. The owner, Michael, kindly took an interest in me, and fatefully, several years of conversation began. I was so taken by his kindness and his breadth of knowledge that I would frequently show up after school to talk. I'd sweep up and close shop with him, and felt that he'd taken me under his wing. He introduced me to a broad range of literature, from theosophy to medieval magic. In many of the texts, I'd come across the enigmatic phrase, and of course, all this is explained in the Kabbalah. Looking back, this was a kind of beckoning call so I finally asked Michael about it, and he handed me a copy of The Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune. It turns out she was an extraordinary woman who studied psychoanalysis at the University of London, and she worked as a lay analyst 
and she took part in the European magical revival in the early 20th century. Her book, The Mystical Kabbalah, framed those arcane ideas in psychoanalytic language without abandoning the mystical spirit of the tradition. Now, this was about 1935. So I dug into the book and quickly realized that the ideas were totally beyond me. And yet, surprisingly, I read it diligently four, maybe five times that summer. Very slowly, I began to integrate the ideas. And in hindsight, I was unconsciously driven toward the ordering principle embedded in the philosophy, and particularly its primary archetypal symbol, the Tree of Life. Years later, through Jung's work, I came across the idea that certain symbols reflect archetypal wholeness, which have a particularly powerful healing impact on the soul, particularly in their ability to organize the various layers and functions in the psyche. So my thinking, which as an ENFJ is my inferior function, was exposed to an advanced philosophic tradition. This was the beginning of differentiating my thinking from my unconscious material, which was quite literally life-saving, because I was raised in an extremely violent and chaotic home. By the time I was a teenager, I had internalized a kind of uh, dangerous wildness. As the primary Kabbalistic ideas and images worked their way into me, the idea of a cosmic order emerged in my mind, memorizing the concepts, reflecting on them, meditating on them, very slowly over years, created an ordering principle inside me. And I can say without any hesitation, it saved my life. I mean, I was headed down a really dangerous road, and nobody was going to stop me in the outside world. So I attributed my ability to survive into my 30s, at least, to having access to this material. So it gave you a structure and an ordering principle that you did not get from your home life? Not from my home life at all. I do think being raised Catholic helped me to a degree. Even as a young child, I had a kind of natural religious temperament. I was the only religious person in my family. Over time, the religion of my childhood was simply not sophisticated enough, but it did cultivate my devotion to the transcendent, which became a kind of pole star. Sure. And so the Kabbalah really gave me something I just couldn't get anywhere else. Yes, yeah, I, I can see that. The, the way that, um, that a, a child might experience uh, Christianity or Catholicism being, being brought up in a kind of local church, it would not have a lot of the depth or nuance that most of the mystical tr traditions in any religion tend to offer. You know, a couple things come up to me, come up for me with that story, Joseph, and of course it's very moving. First of all, you know, this image of 16-year-old Joseph going to the, the bookstore after, after school to sweep up and, and talk to Michael. You know, I, I think that my, my guess is that you had a spiritual hunger that was in part driven by your chaotic upbringing. But I think that a spiritual hunger like that is often an element of uh, sort of late adolescence, that as we head toward our kind of coming of age, we often do turn inward and seek for deeper rivers of meaning than those that have been offered by the culture to us. So I think that's probably a pretty common experience. And then I think it's also lovely that Michael didn't give you a book on Kabbalah until you asked for it. Isn't that true? That in a lot of uh, mystical traditions, 
that you have to knock on the door in order for it to be opened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and certainly I was lucky enough to come across that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's really lovely. It was, that was when the time was right. Quite so. Quite so. And that Mm -hmm. my need, even though I was so young, was visible enough that, uh, another adult could take an interest in, Mm -hmm. in my drive towards, uh, yeah. Transcendent. Thank goodness for Michael. Absolutely. I, uh, he was the mediating factor. Yes. Yes. And in some ways, mm-hmm. a substitute parental figure in this mm-hmm. kind of spiritual curiosity. But the other thing that I'm hearing already, and I've, I've been curious about this. I mean, you and I have never, never talked about this is sort of how, how these dual, uh, trees have grown up in your psychic backyard, Kabbalism and Jung. And I can hear already that um, Kabbalah was an experience first and foremost. And, and that one of the things that, that happened when, when you started studying Jung was you then had better access to understanding what that experience was and what it had done for you and what it had meant to you. Absolutely. The two systems really are congruent. As my curiosity carried me deeper into the Western mystery tradition, I came across another author, Paul Foster Case, who in the early 1900s took as his mission the reinterpretation of very arcane texts like the Zohar and the Behir. He used modern language and idioms, as well as the concepts of analytical psychology to reframe those traditions. When I came across Case's writing, I found them challenging but relatively accessible. When I was 21, I encountered Jung's ideas directly and felt a strange familiarity. It wasn't until many years later that I realized Case had been whispering Jung's ideas in my ear not fully or completely, but enough for me to recognize the feeling. It wasn't until I became serious about Jung's canon of work that I could really appreciate how successfully Case had forged a relationship between the Kabbalah and Jungian concepts, which has stood me very well across these many years. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I know a little bit about the Kabbalah. I don't know a lot. And I wonder if you could just kind of give an overview of Kabbalism, I suppose. That's a tall order, I'm assuming. But, but especially if you can do it in such a way that kind of translating it into Jungian terms a little bit, so that that will be a doorway for, for me and perhaps for, for some of our listeners. So the first thing I would say is that there were and still are different traditions of Kabbalah. Like any other ancient system, it eventually dispersed and cross-pollinated other cultures and religions. So I would venture to say that there is no definitive single Kabbalah. And as you had said in the introduction, around the 12th century in southern France, written fragments of the oral tradition seem to have surfaced. It's clear, like many mystery traditions, the wisdom was passed person to person or mouth to ear. And by the way, modern Freemasonry still uses this method of transmission. So... It was around the 12th century in Spain, from within the Sephardic Jewish community, that the Zohar apparently was written, and it was the most comprehensive written description of Kabbalah, and it's where we find descriptions of the Kabbalistic tree of life, which for me, as I said, has been the most important integrative symbol, and I'll unpack that a bit. So, 
The Tree of Life depicts ten spheres or categories that are assigned to aspects of divine action, which correspond to ten aspects of human psychology or psycho-spiritual dynamics. Some teachers present the Tree of Life as a description of the personality of God, and some even link the spheres to the celestial body of God. So, right out of the gate, there is a weaving between the cosmic and the personal, which all human beings unconsciously resonate with. We see vestiges of this in American culture with the abiding interest in astrology. No matter what religious creed people align with, they still check their horoscope and delight if they find a correspondence with a personal happening. They don't think of this as a religious impulse, but it absolutely is. The claim that the planets have a corresponding effect on the human soul haunts our imaginations. Ancient astrologers who were the first astronomers intuited that the geometric relationships between the planets as they orbit correspond to the progression of relationships between inner psychic factors and outer circumstances. We are a psychic solar system, so to speak. So all humans have an innate instinct to link the above and the below. And Jung called this the religious instinct. So we even we even have a need to understand how we are linked to the cosmos. Absolutely. And I think Jung gets to this when he writes about the religious instinct. He surmised that human beings create religions because their psyches need some systematized way to approach this idea, and out of that emerge various practices, often including ways to induce visionary states and generate heightened emotional experiences, all of which reinforces the idea that human beings have a relationship to the cosmos. You know, and, and Jung talked about how there were kind of two ways of being in the world. One was just dealing with the ordinary every day, the stuff that we're used to doing all of the time, but that we also, all of us, have one foot in the eternal world. And I think that this uh, relates to uh, his early experience of having two personalities. From a young age, he felt that he had, he called them personality number one and personality number two. Personality number one was the student who went to university, who tried to figure out what kind of career he was going to have, who worked at the Berkholsley, and uh, personality number two was eternal and timeless and had access to something much deeper. So I think that, that you're, you're picking up on something really fundamental, Joseph, that we, we, we have a need to relate to that other dimension of experience as well, and that mystical systems are one way to do that. Absolutely. I beautifully said that whether we talk about the temples of Asclepius, where people would go and be coached by the priests to bring their concerns, their health problems, other things to the gods, and then in the morning their dreams would be interpreted and a kind of solution would be offered, that drive to move towards the mystery, towards the underneath, towards the divine, even in ways that are very pragmatic, to solve uh, personal issues, is something that's woven into history and into humanity. So coming back a little bit more to the story of Kabbalah, one of the things I'm reflecting on at the moment, 
is that the word Kabbalah means to receive or to be receptive, and that so much of Kabbalah practices, as well as other mystical traditions, are designed to cultivate that receptivity upward, that there is something higher or deeper than the ego, and that there are methods to formulate a relationship to that. And Jung was talking about the exact same thing. For him, dream work was absolutely a way of being in dialogue between the ego and whatever this mysterious depth was. When I think about our work as analysts, when we're working with our analysands, so much of what we're doing is trying to help the analysand organize psychic content in such a way that it clears a path of receptivity and relationship between the ego and what we call is the self. And that once that path is opened up, metaphorically, that these higher forces, psychological or spiritual or both, seem to have a stronger effect on the ego, moving it forward in its evolution towards whatever its teleological destiny is. And, and of course, we, we think about that as the ego-self axis, which we've talked about before on the podcast, that there's some kind of channel of communication between the waking conscious self and the, the self with a capital S, which is the ordering center of the personality. And that part of us, which holds the, the sort of germ of our, our destiny or our sense of how we're meant to unfold. Beautifully said. The idea of the ego self access, which is often attributed to Jung, was actually described first by Eric Neumann, which I suspect was informed by his Jewish upbringing and likely exposure to both Talmudic and Kabbalistic writings. I just want to clarify the difference between rabbinic Kabbalah and Hellenistic Kabbalah, which I was trained in, the original Kabbalistic teachings, for the most part, limited their amplifications of the ideas to the Torah and Talmud. The tradition I was initiated into, constellated in northern Africa, and was influenced by the Hellenistic traditions that flourished in the communities attached to the great library of Alexandria, so, congruent with my tradition, I avail myself of any relevant idioms to bring forward central ideas, unlike our Lurianic friends who have a strictly Jewish and historic frame. I'd like to take another moment to contrast Jungian work with the Western mystery tradition of which the Hellenistic Kabbalah is a part. Jung gives us a sense that the self is active, and our job is to listen for its influence and lend aid and support for its efforts to manifest in our lives. As Jungians, we try to track the self through dream work, synchronicities, and I would also say projections, Taking our projections seriously is like following a faint trail through a forest as we reflect on where we're being led. Overall, the sense is that the self is beckoning and we should follow at its pace. The Western mystery tradition has a much more proactive stance where the ego itself is offered philosophies, methods, symbols, rituals to create particular inner conditions that make the ego more receptive 
to the influences of the self. A metaphor that might be helpful involves growing tomatoes. You could plant tomatoes in a field, and depending on the natural processes of rain, sunshine, the ability to fend off insects and such, you would have a certain crop at the end of that. But you could also plant a tomato in a hothouse and regulate the growth factors so that the plant grows faster with less hardship. You'd get a larger crop. Both methods rely on the natural teleological process inherent in tomatoes, but the enhanced method moves things along more quickly and brings forward a greater abundance. Hothouse method corresponds to the accelerated human growth possible through mystical methods, and as an aside, both corporations and military teams are harvesting these ancient methods toward their own ends. That's really interesting, Joseph, because what I'm thinking as I'm listening to you talk is that I have certainly had uh, people that I have worked with where I am thinking, okay, where's the self? When is the self going to activate? We're trying to kind of clear that path to the self and we're listening for the self and it's, it's not showing up yet or it's not showing up very quietly And I think many times in analytic work, it is very much that the person comes in and is really ready to do this. And in your language, the self is kind of online and we just have to clear away some cobwebs and then things get going. But occasionally there's someone who comes in and I I really am struggling to see the the self at work in the person's life and and so you're you're giving me a new way to think about it that it 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 might require for some of us a cultivation and i'm i'm thinking about uh some of the techniques that you've alluded to that maybe you'll talk more about in in detail in jungian analysis the techniques tend to be dream work active imagination and and also a kind of cultivated listening. So you talked about taking our projection seriously, taking your moods seriously, being being curious. And, and in essence, these are kinds of techniques. And I guess I'm thinking about technologies of transcendence. It seems like every culture uh, that has ever existed has developed some technologies of transcendence, whether it's meditation or fasting, or drumming, or, or uh, any of these other activities that produce a slight change in consciousness, something that Jung referred to as an abasement de niveau mental. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking that in this internet age, we all have greater access to these methods now. We can go online and discover the arcane secrets of kundalini yoga, of indigenous spiritual practices, of plant medicine like ayahuasca and psilocybin. For us Jungians, we use methods that introduce analysands to corrective archetypes embedded in fairy tales and myths. It is a way of courting an archetype. Fairy tale therapy, more common with European analysts, involves cultivating a relaxed state, then reading a fairy tale carefully chosen to address an unconscious conflict. And the famous hypnotherapist Milton Erickson similarly used this principle very creatively and he formulated something he called therapeutic metaphors, which he'd voice to clients when they were in a light trance and apparently were very successful. This curative activation of the archetypal level of the psyche was intuitively applied in the elaborate staging of Greco-Roman myths. Freud 
discussed how these induced catharsis or a kind of curative emotional release. But I suspect there's even more going on on a deeper level. Hermetic or Hellenistic Kabbalah has its own methods that begins with the organization of the mind through integrating its philosophies. It cultivates a method of thinking that creates a kind of lattice work in the soul onto which we can organize our induced mystical experiences. We all understand the difficulty of integrating peak experiences. For example, we often have amazing dreams, but when we wake up, we can only recall an exalted feeling that, more often than not, fades. If we don't have a pre-existing lattice of understanding, we tend to forget the dream wisdom we've been offered. And if we lack the language to even describe the experience, it fades into a vestigial impression. And that's why analysands often start recalling dreams once they're in analysis, because they begin to build up a philosophy to hold them in. So in my tradition, we always begin with integrating special language and ideas, which then disciplines and ripens the mind. It helps us control our thinking and organizes our previous life experiences by grouping them in philosophical baskets, so to speak, which aids us in differentiating from the massa confusa of the unconscious. So, returning to the Tree of Life, the ten philosophical baskets correspond to the ten spheres. The twenty-two paths that link them together have related ideas that amplify each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, adding depth and philosophic nuance to it. Once we know the basic frame in the Hellenistic tradition, then we can find many different unique ways to amplify and probably most importantly, relativize the concepts. Can, can you give an example sure. of, of these spheres? And, and So one of the interesting Kabbalistic ideas, which I think Jung um, resonated with, whether or not he encountered it through Kabbalah, is the idea that there are pairs of opposites inside of us. And so in the Tree of Life, one of the spheres, Hod, which means splendor, is associated with the rational and thinking function in the human personality. On the other side of the tree, its opposite is called netzak, which means victory, which is associated with the desire aspect of the human psyche. And Freud was talking about this. I would suspect, and this is purely supposition, that Freud had access to this material in some form, and Hood would correspond to his description of the ego, and Netzach would correspond in some ways to the id, and that the right or wrong relationship between those factors can create symptoms or relieve symptoms. Now, one of the things that Kabbalah is bold to declare is that there is a sequence between the Sephiroth that suggests that life force flows in a particular direction. So, amplifying that little bit about Hud and Netzach, energy flows into Netzach, and then it moves horizontally towards the intellect. Now, this sets in motion an entire philosophic 
idea around the relationship between the desire instinctive level versus the intellect. Mm. And one thing we could say is that when we are in right order, that in desire nature, the deep desire nature, should be informing the intellect, which would then take upon itself the labor of finding ways to actualize what the desire has revealed to us. I'm just thinking about, you know, you, Joseph, having access to to this concept that you've just been exploring. And uh, it seems like it would be a helpful way of understanding lots of different things. And I'm imagining that it's something that comes up for you or is part of your frame when you're working with uh, someone analytically. Is that, w- would you say that, that Kabbalah is one of your tools in the consulting room? Absolutely. And, and when I was a younger uh, therapist, I might reference it more blatantly or more ham-handedly, to be honest, <laughs> which was not always helpful to people. But when I began to reference it philosophically or offer ideas that rise out of my understanding, that was much more useful to people. So something just as simple as somebody tells me you know, a goal that they have or that they've set for themselves and for us to have a meaningful conversation about what part of you came up with that agenda? Mm-hmm. Was it really just the egoic side of you that was autonomously kind of formulating its own directions? Or did something deeper inside of you, a deeper seed image from the soul, bring forward both an image and the libidinous desire to make it so, and then passed it onto the ego. In that way, then the ego is in right relationship to deeper structures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the former way, the ego is acting purely autonomously, which brings us to the whole story of the Tower of Babel. That Mm. when the ego just wants to build its own structures without any kind of input, from the transpersonal, what it's building is not likely to be able to withstand the psychic tensions that are likely to come up. You know, the process that you've, that we've been focusing on here as an example between uh, this desire and, and intellect, it seems to me that that's exactly what happened to you as a young man that you had all of this unchanneled energy, all of this unchanneled desire that could have spilled off into a dark direction, but actually the Kabbalah gave you the, the hood, the, the, the way to channel this into the intellect and make something very different out of it. Exactly so. And so if we were to think about this in practical terms, I will often ask clients, what do you want? What is the wantingness in you? Not what you think you should want or you think you should pursue or what somebody else told you to pursue, but first to be able to differentiate that magnetic wantingness that human beings are capable of. Many of us that have been raised in traumatizing environments are alienated from our wantingness, that we're taught that our natural responses and direction of movement are somehow problematic or even dangerous and that we have to adapt whatever our authority figures demand of us. And it can take a long time for people to unravel that. You know, it's, it's interesting because as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about Jung's notion of the libido and that he has this almost sort of topographical, uh, metaphor that that underlines how he sees libido working in the psyche, he talks about the need for a gradient and that if there isn't a gradient, no libido flows. So, so it kind of conjures up this image of a landscape and then there are channels, dry riverbeds perhaps, through which the libido can flow. And it seems to me that that's maybe another common point 
between Jung and Kabbalah, because with the Kabbalah, there's this idea of sort of the movement of energy through the Sephiroth according to a pre-described pathway. I think we could hang Jung's archetypes on the various Sephiroth or spheres easily, and the Hellenistic tradition encourages us to amplify. For instance, we could assign Venus to Netzach or Victory as she represents that desirousness. We could assign Mercury to Hod or the intellect because of the way in which our minds can move in such a sprightly, rapid way. The mind can touch on innumerable things and travel philosophically between all kinds of ideas and yet be unharmed, as Hermes was. So each of those archetypal images and ideas could be ostensibly organized on the tree, because the ten archetypal spheres are universal. Another amplification on the Hellenistic tree of life, which I know galls some of my more scholarly friends, is the addition of the archetypal images of the tarot. So, tarot cards apparently appeared in the world about 1200 AD, which is very interesting, because that's about the same time when the Kabbalah was being carried through Europe because the Sephardic Jews were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. This diaspora led to the founding of Kabbalistic schools across Europe. So, the tarot images are, in and of themselves, archetypal images, inspired by the doctrines associated with the 22 Hebrew letters. So, for instance, As libido, or life force, moves from the sphere of desire, Venus, Netzach, victory, and travels over to the sphere of intellect, Mercury, Hod, splendor, it passes through the path of the letter Pe, which is amplified through the 16th tarot card, the lightning struck tower. And this speaks to the volatile action that true desire exerts on the intellect that has been alienated from its foundation. It strikes the ego like lightning, disrupting the way that we have been deporting ourselves, the way we've been thinking, the way we've been living in a world, in a way that forces the ego to integrate what is true on a deep, instinctive and creative level. Jung saw this all the time, both in himself and in his analysands, and I would venture to say that Jung's creative illness over those two years when he was swamped by agonizing visions could be understood through this little piece of Kabbalah. The power of pay forced Jung to integrate material that his ego was defended against. It also opened him to visionary experiences that were pivotal for his development, both as a clinician and as a human being. And and later in his life, Jung had uh, very specifically Kabbalistic visions. Uh, maybe maybe I can share that, and we can talk about that for a minute. Sure. So, I believe Jung was in his late 60s when he had a heart attack. And while he was being treated for this, uh, several really important things happened. One of which is he had a near-death experience that hopefully we'll talk about that one day on the podcast. But uh, after the near-death experience, he was convalescing and he had a series of visions. And I'm just going to read here. I'm reading from Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. During those weeks, I lived in a strange rhythm. By day, I was usually depressed. I felt weak and wretched and scarcely dared to sit. Gloomily, I thought, now I must go back to this drab world. Toward evening, I would fall asleep, and my sleep would last until about midnight. Then I would come to myself and lie awake for about an hour, but in an utterly transformed state. 
It was as if I were in ecstasy. I felt as though I were floating in space, as though I were safe in the womb of the universe, in a tremendous void but filled with the highest possible feeling of happiness. This is eternal bliss, I thought. This cannot be described. It is far too wonderful. Everything around me seemed enchanted. At this hour of the night, the nurse brought me some food she had warmed, for only then was I able to take any, and I ate with appetite. For a time, it seemed to me that she was an old Jewish woman, much older than she actually was, and that she was preparing ritual kosher dishes for me. When I looked at her, she seemed to have a blue halo around her head. I myself was, so it seemed, in the Pardes Ramonim, the garden of pomegranates, and the wedding of Tifereth with Malkuth was taking place. Or else I was Rabbi Simon ben Yochai, whose wedding in the afterlife was being celebrated. It was the mystic marriage as it appears in the Kabbalistic tradition. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. I could only think continually, now this is the garden of pomegranates. Now this is the marriage of Malkuth and Tifereth. I do not know exactly what part I played in it. At bottom, it was I myself. I was the marriage. And my beatitude was that of a blissful wedding. A Jungian scholar, Sanford Drobe, writes extensively about Jung and the Kabbalah. And his thesis is that this vision that Jung had was a demonstration that his unconscious mind was beginning to take an interest in Kabbalah, just as he had had a long-standing interest in alchemy. And that if he had lived longer, it is likely that Jung would have taken on a symbolic analysis of Kabbalistic imagery and thought. And it's a a loss to all of us that he did not live long enough for that to happen. Mm. And yet even with the images that he did see in the vision, we can hear the resonance with his philosophies. The marriage of Tifereth and Malkuth has to do with this restoration So we borrow this idea in Christianity that there was some kind of a primal separation between humanity, the earth, and the divine. Often Christians will think about it as the fall from grace, starting with the Edenic rupture, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, and then this long metaphoric journey that leads eventually to the birth and the manifestation of Christ and the ascension of Christ, which theologically is this restoration of relationship between humans, the earth, and the divine. On the Kabbalistic tree of life, this is inferred by the goal, not so much the happening of it quite yet, but the vision and the goal that Tifereth, which is associated with these messianic symbols, and Malkuth, which is the sphere associated with the physical world, will somehow marry. And this restoration of the below and the above will be restored, which goes again to Neumann's idea of the ego self access being restored. Yeah, that that would be it on the personal level, is that we would have this internal restoration with our own source. I sense that Jung was often very private about the way in which he danced with these symbols and philosophies, but it was substantial enough that in the middle of a life-threatening health crisis, the unconscious brought Kabbalah forward and wrapped it in a kind of ecstasy. This would have likely motivated him to take it up. I believe, Jung said, these visions were the most tremendous things he'd experienced. That's quite a statement. 
As we're drawing to a close on this topic, I'm always left with the sense that more has been unsaid than could possibly be said. Well, this is such an enormous topic. It's enormous, and it's full of an enormous amount of feeling for me. So sometimes it's a challenge to get it out cogently, because it's wrapped in my soul with such intensity. The last idea I'd like to leave with people, which I hope will motivate them to pursue this further, is that the tree of life is like a series of gears and cogs. It creates a powerful healing symbol of the machinery of the universe. When we have a really comprehensive, multi-layered, living symbol, we are able to train the soul to conceptualize things far beyond its current experiences. And as we move forward with that discipline, it prepares us to receive and hold increasingly powerful experiences, much like Jung did in his visions, and make use of them as he did. So I hope People will take this in hand, and the two authors I would recommend to people at the start are Dion Fortune, whose work I've described and reflects the Hellenistic tradition, and R.A. Kaplan's work that approaches the topic from a traditional rabbinic perspective. So, if this has stimulated something in your soul, This may be a place to find subtle breadcrumbs that you might follow as you move through this forest of ideas. And we'll put those references in the show notes. Well, Joseph, thank you for sharing this with us. I know it's been tremendously important to you, and uh, it was very generous of you to bring us into this part of your world. It feels strangely intimate, even though these ideas are widely available, but because they're so woven into the fabric of my psyche, it feels strangely confessional and disassembling of it. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it all the more. So maybe it's time to transition to a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Today's dream is from a woman who's 46 years old and works in outdoor education and community projects and mentoring and soul guiding. And here's the dream. I'm in Putin's inner circle. It's attached to some other business place that I'm working in. I'm wearing a suit. He's got an office, like in a 1920s socialist apartment building, with tall ceilings. It's not particularly high security, and I'm in it. The place is a bit messy. Putin is thin. He looks like the younger Putin, not the rounder-faced one we see on TV. He's getting medication out of boxes, and I see they are statins, and I figure he's got heart trouble. I take a seat on a sofa, and we are talking. I'm thinking about how vulnerable he looks, like a nice man, actually. I'm sensing that he trusts me. We have a good, easy rapport. 
I'm wondering whether he knows I'm queer and what he would make of that given the state of LGBTQ rights in Russia. I figure out that there are two Putins, this real one behind the scenes and the one on TV. The one on TV is a body double, but the rest of the world doesn't know that. I wonder how I'm going to keep this from the world and whether it will ever come out, that I know him and how I would justify that to the media. I go to the bathroom off his office and Putin's bath is running. I gather that he is going to have a bath. I go back into the office, smoke a cigarette on the sofa, and we talk some more, and then I leave. I go to another room where two of my friends are. Out of affection, I kiss my friend A repeatedly on the face, whose name I get wrong. She tells me her name is something else. It's the first time I've heard her tell me the name that she says she is hers. I know her by at least two other names. I accidentally kiss her on the lips. The other friend, B, is there too, and then I realize that I have kissed B, not A. B asks me whether I've been smoking cannabis because there is a really strong smell on my breath. I think about the cigarette I smoked in Putin's office and wonder how it could have left such a strong smell. And for context, she says, The future feels unclear. I'm growing roots in a rural area I moved to from a big city three years ago. I recently moved from a house share in a small town to living alone rurally. I have also been exploring forming an intentional community with others, and this cycle of exploration is now coming to a close. I don't know what the outcome of it will be. I don't have clarity about my work situation. I've recently finished my involvement in supporting a course. I'm exploring other collaborations too. I attended an interview for a job last week, which I then withdrew as it wasn't right. I'm wanting more structure in my life, some level of dependability. I am wanting good work-life balance. I am wanting to root. I am not in an intimate relationship with anyone. Being queer and living rurally, this is difficult. I don't know that I am ready for a relationship in any case. Two years ago, I ended a 10-year exclusive relationship and am considering whether other relationship models are possible for me. I am making the most of my solitude to do inner work, I am concerned that I have started smoking again. I am wanting to engage in some recovery work, as I never really gave this my full attention. And she says the feelings in the dream were empathy with Putin, a good natural rapport between us, feeling confident and authentic around him, and I felt liked by him and liked him back. Affection for my friend A, confusion over A's name, Surprise and self-consciousness over why my breath smelled of cannabis. And finally, she, she notes, I have started smoking again recently. The dream landed on the morning of a hangover, and I normally don't drink these days, but I've had an uneasy relationship with alcohol in the past. The war in Ukraine is not abating and on the edge of my consciousness all the time. London Pride just took place, and I didn't do anything to celebrate. I used to wear suits and work in offices, but now I live rurally and work outdoors. One lens that I'm tempted to lay on it is the classic compensatory dream that whenever we constellate an ego attitude, let's say of fear or hatred, at that exact same moment we constellate a nodal point in the unconscious of courage and love and relatedness and vice versa. So I'm wondering if, because Putin right now has become a kind of international villain, and the intensity with which the dreamer might be relating to that, particularly because it seems like she lives in Europe, that the dream then gives her an experience of Putin being harmless and knowable and ordinary and in a kind of calm, reciprocal relationship with the ego, the dream ego. And that's a way of letting go of some of the feelings of fear or horror that might be interfering with her psychological functioning. So the dream will often give us the opposite experience of what we're feeling to bring us, on a feeling level, if nothing else, to a middle ground which will help us function better. This reminds me of dreams that I've had as well. 
Well, I'm noticing that Putin is is kind and likable and that he's got heart trouble. So there's some problem the dreamer's having uh, with her heart, uh, with, the, with the realm of feeling, perhaps. Um, I, I'm also really struck by the references to substance use and substance abuse in both the associations and in the dream. And, I, and it makes me think that there's really something here about that. So, you know, she, she notes that um, B asks whether she's been smoking cannabis. I wish I knew a little bit more about who B was because B kind of calls her out. And she didn't say she'd been smoking weed. She said she'd been smoking a cigarette. But in fact, it must, it must be cannabis because B, B says, you know, you have such a strong uh, smell on your breath of cannabis. And she even says, I, I think about the cigarette I smoked and wonder how it could have left such a strong smell. But it's not a strong smell of, of uh, nicotine or tobacco. It's a strong smell of, of marijuana. And um, she does note that she is wanting to engage in some recovery work as she has never given this her full attention and uh, that she's had a, an uneasy relationship with alcohol. I also find myself focusing so much on the, on the context because um, when I read that paragraph, you know, the future feels unclear, I'm growing roots in a rural area, there was so much ambivalence there's ambivalence about leaving the city. There's ambivalence about uh, living in the rural area. There's a, there's there's wanting more structure, but maybe res- resisting more structure. So I think that there's a great deal of confusion, uh, perhaps in the dreamer's life and in the inner world. And w- one of the things about Putin is sort of if we if we play that game that's sometimes useful when looking at dreams is if you didn't know who Putin was. How would you describe how if I knew nothing about Putin, how would you describe him? Sometimes I'll ask Analyzans that with a dream like this. I might say, pretend I don't know who Putin is. Describe him for me in two sentences. And it, it might be something like, well, he's a real kind of uh, autocratic ruler. You know, he's a real tyrant. He's bringing back this autocratic rule to Russia. And and so in a sense, he is the principle of let's call it the father. And the father can either be uh, kind of ordering and law giving in the positive sense, or in the negative sense that can tip over into being the tyrant. And I wonder if perhaps there hasn't been enough order and stability in this dreamer's life recently. And the psyche is using Putin as an image of what's needed. uh, But but, you know, obviously not, not to the extent where it becomes tyrannical, but this is, the, this is the kind version of that ordering principle, if you will. So if we take that lens, which I like very much, that the ordering principle, the autocratic king, we could say in a fairy tale. So we might say, once upon a time, there was a king who had heart trouble. Mm-hmm. So that, that gives us a certain kind of feeling just as you were saying, that the ordering principle inside of the psyche is struggling. Mm -hmm. We could say heart trouble might mean that, quite frankly, there's uh, some difficulty around the feeling function. There's not enough feeling. Uh, We could go from that to say, literally, there's not enough love in the Mm -hmm. ordering principle as well. This also reminds me of the idea of the old king or the dying king that the ordering principle that you were mentioning, Lisa, could be on the way out, and that has lost its potency, that Putin in the dream is thin and he's frail, he's not commanding dangerously the way he's perceived in the outer world. Although she says he looks like the younger Putin. Mm. So it might be that he's on his way out, or it might be that this is the again, the benign version of this ordering principle. And then I, I'm, I'm curious about the bath. Mm-hmm. He's, he's about to have a bath, which would be a sort of image perhaps of saludio in, in the unconscious or into the feeling realm. And 
is there an invitation there? Is, is the dreamer meant to perhaps take a bath with Putin, but then she doesn't and she comes out and she smokes a cigarette? I love that. I mean, that's <laughs> no, really, that's, that's great. I think this, this also points to something that can be confusing sometimes for the LGBTQ community as they relate to certain gender-specific ideas in Jung's philosophy. And so it's not uncommon for um, a queer woman, for instance, to have a dream about a male figure. There might be an opportunity for a kind of conjoining of one kind or another, but the ego feels, this isn't right to me, this isn't, I don't find this attractive, I'm attracted to, uh, to other women, or vice versa for gay men. So the challenge can be to really develop the symbolic attitude that, that nothing in the dream is literal. It's not literally Putin, and it's not literally a man for that, uh, for that matter. But the sense that the missed opportunity for the ego and the ordering principle to get into the tub and like the rosarium alchemical images the king and queen get into the tub naked and then this very elaborate alchemical process moves mm -hmm. forward where the ego and the ordering principle would actually meld or merge with each other my fantasy along those lines, Joseph, is that there's this growing intimacy with Putin in the dream that leads up to her going into the bathroom, which is a very intimate space, seeing the water running. Perhaps there's a sense that there is this invitation to get in the bath with Putin. And instead, she doesn't. So she, she pulls away from that encounter and then stupefies herself with the cigarette. So, you know, the way that substance dependence or, or use is often about uh, kind of numbing ourselves or escaping from something. Not that, that it's not appropriate to do sometimes, but if we're doing it too much, then we're choosing away from uh, the tuning to ourself. And, and I wonder if that's what happens here at the end of the dream. And then it's, it's B who kind of says, wait a minute, what are you doing? Why does your breath smell so much like cannabis? And if we think of cannabis as part of the whole canon of sedating uh, drugs, medications, that that also kind of puts us backwards in time, kind of is the seduction of becoming younger than we are, or more passive than we would be naturally. So I'm wondering if also, at least along that same line, that Putin's running the bath, they're both in the bathtub, there is this opportunity for intimacy and then it's at that point that the ego then leaves or is almost compelled to leave because of the implications of what might happen next. And then she, as you said, retreats into the ca cannabis, but also retreats to the familiar relationship to the feminine as the primary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when she says in the context that her future feels unclear, it's not quite structured that her own plans, her own ability to organize and lead herself into whatever the next campaign is for her life is part of this trouble, staying close to the inner male figure. And when things get uncomfortable, going back to the familiar female figures inside of her. Yeah, I really like that, Joseph. And it, it brings up for me, it's worth talking about, uh, the fact that it's Putin, because it does show, I mean, I, th I think dreams do this a lot. Dreams will take whatever is on hand and throw it into the mix in ways that are really surprising. And so, you know, people have all kinds of dreams about political figures and, and it usually doesn't really mean what it means in the outer world. However, this is Putin. And it makes me wonder if there isn't a deep ambivalence toward this inner ordering principle that the dreamer perhaps has struggled with her whole life in my fantasy about it, that it's that perhaps being kind of ordered and regular and disciplined is something with which he struggled. I'm just making it up. Sure. 
and again, if we think of Putin in the outer world right now, you know, he's in that war-making place. So part of what could be offered here is that the ego is being offered access to her own ferocity, mm -hmm. her own ability to go war, to war with her addictive impulses, to go to war in order to fight for whatever the next career is that's deeply moving to her, or to fight to get wherever she needs to go. And that war as a metaphor, of course, can be more useful than when it's literalized, of course. But we do have to often go to war with ourselves in order to get things to move along in a constructive way. The last thing I might mention is that just she's 46. So she's moving, she's in midlife, and she's moving through a midlife process. So some of these things, I think, also are attributable to the pressure inside of all of us to advance and to make good on our unlived life for the second half of life, which just as you said, Lisa, may require a relationship to these uh, Putin energies inside of her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.